All right, Dr. Greenway, our president of Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary uh, is uh, now online and uh, connecting in. Good morning. And ready to go. So Dr. Greenway, we are delighted to have you with us today, sharing with us on the issue of church revitalization. I uh, present to you Dr. Adam Greenway, the ninth president of Southwestern Seminary, is also a professor of evangelism and apologetics. So Dr. Greenway, uh, the, the rest of our time is uh, yours this morning, so go ahead. Well, thank you, Dr. Priest, and let me uh, begin by saying uh, how much I appreciate uh, Kenneth Priest's leadership as a director uh, of our Center for Church Revitalization here at Southwestern Seminary. I want to uh, add a personal word of greeting to all of you who are joining us this morning uh, via Zoom for this uh, church revitalization uh, webinar and uh, conference. Let me obviously express my regret that we are not able to, uh, to host this uh, physically here on the campus of Southwestern Seminary, but of course these are extraordinary times. But thanks to the miracle of technology, uh, we had the chance to, uh, to be together this morning. And I wanna just add a, a word of exhortation to you. You're gonna find over the course of this day uh, an extraordinary group of uh, presenters and speakers, each of whom will have a unique perspective, a uh, contribution to make in the ministry of church revitalization. So I hope you're able to stay for uh, as much of the day as you can with this uh, webinar with uh, different uh, presenters, pastors, and denominational leaders, and others who will be bringing insights about uh, church revitalization. Uh, our heartbeat at Southwestern Seminary is to equip God-called individuals for more faithful Christian service that glorifies God and fulfills the Great Commission. And at the heartbeat of who we are at Southwestern Seminary is the local visible church, is the uh, ministry of what happens when the people of God gather together. And even in this moment where we're not able to physically gather together, where we are uh, virtually connecting more perhaps than we ever have done, this is a season where it could be very discouraging, to be honest. It could be a, a challenging time for pastors and trying to understand how to shepherd uh, their flocks through these moments. And the fact that you are here and part of this uh, webinar, I want you to know, is a great encouragement to me personally. I want you to know that Southwestern Seminary wants to be the best uh, resource and partner and supporter of pastors and local churches we can be. Uh, we are an uh, institution that is deeply committed to helping you in your ministry as much as we can. And so uh, I'm thankful to have these moments together uh, with you this morning. The topic that we're looking at is biblical revitalization. And I had the chance to kind of uh, frame in a, in a broad sense the, uh, the task, the necessity, the ministry of church revitalization. And I'm drawn to a, a passage that is not unfamiliar, I'm sure, to many of you. You have probably preached it or taught on it from uh, Acts chapter 20. And what I wanna do in a few moments together is kind of look at uh, where I believe we find an example uh, in scripture of the ministry of revitalization. That is, if, if we have the chance to take a, a look at a church uh, that we see in the New Testament uh, of its uh, origins, of uh, seasons, of uh, revitalization, and principles or lessons we can learn from that that we find uh, in the pages of, uh, of God's Word. And that church uh, that I have a particular interest in this morning is the church at, uh, at Ephesus. So. Uh, Acts chapter 20 is where we find uh, uh, one of the most extended uh, pastoral councils in all the New Testament, and it centers around the ministry of the church in Ephesus. Uh, Paul, of course, is the one who is speaking here. Uh, Dr. Luke is the one who is writing this on the inspiration of the Spirit of God. I'm going to read for a little bit, beginning there in verse 17 of Acts chapter 20. would encourage you to follow along in your copy of of God's Word, either in print or electronic form. And I am reading from the uh, Christian Standard Bible uh, provided by our friends at uh, Lifeway in honor of my friend Matt Hensley, who is on this call today. Now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and summoned the elders of the church. When they came to him, he said to them, you know, from the first day I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility, with tears and during the trials that came to me through the plots of the Jews, you know that I did not avoid proclaiming to you anything that was profitable or for teaching you publicly and from house to house. I testified to both Jews and Greeks about repentance toward God 
and faith in our Lord Jesus. And now I am on my way to Jerusalem, compelled by the Spirit, not knowing what I will encounter there, except that in every town the Holy Spirit warns me that chains and afflictions are waiting for me. But I consider my life of no value to myself. My purpose is to finish my course and the ministry I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of God's grace. And now I know that none of you, among whom I went about preaching the kingdom, will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all of you, because I did not avoid declaring to you the whole plan of God. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Men will rise up even from your own number and distort the truth to lure the disciples into following them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for three years, I never stopped warning each one of you with tears. And now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know I've worked my own hands to support myself and those who are with me. In every way I've shown you that it is necessary to help the weak by laboring like this and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus because he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. And of course, we have this powerful scene there of tears and prayers at, at the end. It's a fascinating text for a number of reasons. Uh, obviously, as is indicated here, Paul had uh, spent three years in um, leadership development, in discipleship, uh, in ministry there in Ephesus. It was a church that clearly he had a deep uh, love for. And we have here in this scene in Acts, perhaps again, the most extended uh, pastoral exhortations given uh, by the Apostle Paul to a group of pastors, elders, leaders of the church there in Ephesus. And he's making a couple of points that I think are, uh, are salient for us, particularly the attention that has to be given, knowing that the enemy is always at work trying to cause drift, distraction, diversion from God's plan and God's uh, purpose for his people. And so a lot of the exhortation that we find here is directly related to challenging and encouraging the pastors of the church at Ephesus to keep their attention upon what matters most. And that is sound doctrine and faithful ministry. And we see it uh, modeled here by Paul and what he lays out in terms of what he himself had been a part of. You go back there in verse 18, Paul makes the point that uh, they knew uh, the kind of ministry that he had. It was a ministry of integrity. It was a ministry of consistency. It was a ministry of, of humility in terms of what had been going on. It was not an easy path, of course. Uh, verse 19, uh, all of the trials that came to, uh, to him. And uh, even despite that fact, uh, he was unambiguously clear in terms of his commitment to the gospel. Verse 21, I testified to both Jews and Greeks about repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus. Repentance and faith, two sides of the same coin. We call people to turn from their sin and to trust Christ as Savior and Lord. He's going on to Jerusalem, verse 22, compelled by the Spirit, not knowing what all is going to be happening there. Verse 23, except that in every town the Holy Spirit warns me that chains and afflictions are waiting for me. It wasn't necessarily his best life now in terms of a human perspective from a this world standpoint. But again, fidelity to the faith is what matters most, no matter what the challenges may come. It's a reminder to all of us, particularly those of us entrusted with the ministry of shepherding the people of God, if you are faithful in the things God has called you to do, there is going to be adversity. Uh, there is going to be affliction. And even in this moment, we find ourselves in, in the midst of a global pandemic, uh, something unlike anything we have ever experienced. Uh, this should not surprise us in the sense that uh, the Word of God testifies that trials will come our way, hardships will come our way. And particularly if you're on this webinar right now, you may be going through a season of ministry where uh, you're facing uh, what feels like discouragement and trials and questions, and you're not alone. 
In fact, one of the things that um, is so humbling to me is that uh, those who have gone before us provide for us models and examples of faithfulness uh, that we can find great strength in in our own times of, uh, of challenge. One of the things that uh, is very important, particularly in the ministry of church revitalization, is uh, there is no ministry of revitalization that does not come without pain. Because frankly, uh, churches do not drift toward health. They, 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 they don't drift toward uh, success. They don't, they don't drift towards uh, accomplishment. If anything, they drift towards lethargy and apathy and, and indifference. And so as a pastor, if you're trying to turn them back towards the things of God, take them back toward a commitment to the primacy of the Word of God, to the ministry of evangelism and discipleship and the things that ought to characterize the New Testament people of God, in many cases you're going up against... Uh, things that have been set in place that people become very comfortable to, uh, very, very uh, happy with. And as you begin to challenge people in those areas, you're, you may get some pushback. You may encounter some adversity uh, because, in a sense, you are coming in and being used by God to point out things that are not right. Things need to be set right. And oftentimes, again, people who don't like the message will oftentimes attempt to attack or criticize or to silence the messenger. So the work of revitalization is one that uh, oftentimes does bring uh, challenge and adversity. But we find there in verse 24, I think, a, a harbinger of hope uh, that ought to be on our hearts and our minds. And that is when Paul says, but I consider my life of no value to myself. My purpose is to finish my course and the ministry I received. It's not something I earned. It's, it's not something that I chose. It's not something that I sought, but it's a ministry I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of God's grace. It really isn't important what happens to me or pastor, even what happens to you, because you and I are merely instruments in the hands of the Redeemer. It's not ultimately about what we accomplish or what uh, happens to us personally, but it is, are we found faithful in finishing our course and the ministry we receive from the Lord Jesus, and that is to testify, to witness, to warn uh, everyone concerning the gospel of God's uh, grace. And he makes it clear. He realizes that, again, in the urgency of this moment, uh, he will never see them again, humanly speaking, and therefore he declares to them his innocence of the blood of all of them. That's hearkening back, of course, to Ezekiel and the warnings about if you fail to declare uh, my message, uh, I'll hold you accountable. The blood will be on your hands, as God told uh, Ezekiel. Verse 27, because I did not avoid declaring to you the whole plan of God. He, he, uh, I like the fact that uh, Paul was a full gospel uh, preacher. He, he didn't uh, preach only half the truth. He didn't just tell them what they wanted to hear, but what they needed to hear, which, of course, again, is one of the key tasks in revitalization is being willing to uh, tell people that the truth. Uh, the statistics that my friend Kenneth Priest uh, brought up uh, are very insightful. One, about kind of the nature and the composition of our churches uh, as Southern Baptists, but two, also the condition and the state of our churches. Uh, one of the things I've said uh, often in my uh, position here as president of Southwestern Seminary is, uh, unless you are going to plan a church, you should assume that the church ministry you're going to be going into is going to be a ministry of revitalization. Even if the people don't fully appreciate or realize that the church is in a need of revitalization, uh, I think it is a safe assumption to make just because of what happens over time, again, through kind of the natural processes of, of drift and of, of settling, uh, that there's a sense in which we lose that edge, that gospel edge of wanting to be urgently about the task and doing everything we can to make it as humanly impossible for anybody in our community to die and go into a Christless eternity. That's the difference your church makes. Uh, that's the ministry God has given to you. And pastor, the urgency of that, you must never uh, fail to declare to your people, the ones who you are called to, to shepherd. Uh, the fact is that 
there is a responsibility to do all that you can to declare the whole plan of God. And then verse 28, where Paul says, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers. There, there's, there's a twofold satanic attack uh, that the enemy is trying to do uh, at all times. One, it is to, to take you out. And number two, it is to take down your flock. And unfortunately, uh, we know uh, how satanically successful the enemy often is when it comes to taking out pastors and, and leaders uh, through uh, grievous sin, through uh, discouragement, defeat, uh, a sense in which it's easier to, to walk away. I think one of the most sobering realities in the ministry is how often the enemy is pleased to use some of God's own people to do his bidding, to do his work. Uh, some of the greatest challenges and discouragements uh, that have come in my ministry has not been from those outside the household of faith, not those out in the world who obviously have an anti-God, an anti-Christian, an anti-spiritual agenda, but it's from those who oftentimes present themselves amongst the people of God. It's a reminder that, uh, as Paul said would happen, uh, that savage wolves uh, will come in. Verse 29, uh, there'll be those even who will be rising up from within to distort the truth to lure the disciples into following them. So distorting the truth here, of course, has a couple of different ramifications. It's not only the potential presence of false doctrine uh, that can arise in the church, but also uh, false um, uh, practice. Uh, again, of saying that uh, we can move away from the truths of what Christ has called us to do and to be as the New Testament church. We can minimize that which God maximizes, and we can maximize that which God minimizes. And again, any time that we are minimizing the urgency of evangelism and discipleship, uh, we are moving away from God's plan for the church. And those voices can happen even and again. Uh, those who will come from within the, the body, within the, the church, which is again why Paul reminds them literally for three years there was this exhortation of warning even to the point of Paul's own sorrow and Paul's own tears. Uh, I think it was William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, who uh, said, when all else fails, try tears. Pastor, when's the last time you were so burdened over the lostness of your community you began to weep? When's the last time you were so broken over the spiritual condition of your people that moved you to tears. I wonder if part of our challenge today is we have lost what it means to be broken before the Lord, even to the point of tears, being willing to weep where God weeps. So you see, there's, there's, a, there's a spiritual uh, factor that is present here in terms of what is to be happening as pastors, the responsibility to be entrusted to guard our flocks, to uh, hold to sound doctrine, to hold to sound practice, to, to do what is right in, in all things, and uh, to do it with integrity. So that's, that's, you know, again, what we find here in terms of Paul's pastoral exhortation, Paul, Paul's uh, words to the church at Ephesus. Now, you would think that this should be, you know, fairly uh, straightforward and, and simple, and hopefully that it had a lasting impact. But... Let's go over to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, the book of 1 Timothy chapter 1, and uh, let's see uh, what, uh, uh, what happens. So 1 Timothy chapter 1, and beginning there, uh, obviously with the introductory uh, remarks of, uh, of greeting, beginning in verse 3, as I urged you when I went to Macedonia, remain in where? Ephesus. You know, Timothy was, the, uh, by this time, the uh, pastor of the church at Ephesus. Remain in Ephesus so that you may instruct certain people, get this, not to teach false doctrine. Now, uh, New Testament scholars say that this letter was written probably a decade, 15 uh, years after the encounter there in Acts. And uh, we see the warnings in Acts about 
Be on guard for yourselves, he says to the leaders in Ephesus about those who'd rise up, teach false doctrine, lead people astray in the church. Here, now, Timothy is uh, being exhorted by Paul to instruct certain people uh, not to teach false doctrine. The very thing that Paul had warned against in Acts 20 is now what Timothy is having to do as a revitalization pastor in 1 Timothy 1. Not to teach false doctrine or to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies. These promote empty speculations rather than God's plan, which operates by faith. Now the goal of our instruction is love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Some have departed from these and turned aside to fruitless doctrines. And he goes on at this point. The, ve the very things that Paul had warned against, in Acts 20, now are present in the church at Ephesus by 1 Timothy 1. It's a reminder, again, of the fact that uh, even with apostolic exhortation, uh, something had failed on the part of those elders, those leaders, those pastors, in terms of keeping the purity of the flock, protecting the sheep from those who would come in. Again, the goal of the pastor is to build up the sheep to uh, bind up the goats and drive out the wolves from the flock. And the enemy is always trying to work to have, again, a mixed multitude uh, within the church. And here, by this time, this had already happened. And, of course, we know, in addition to the exhortations here that Paul is giving to uh, Timothy, the pastor of the church at Ephesus, you can just go back a few pages, we find an entire inspired letter uh, to the church uh, that Paul writes. Doing what? Well, He's, of course, reminding them of the purity of the gospel. I mean, think back to Ephesians 2. Salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Ephesians 4, the calling and the work of the pastor. Ephesians 6, spiritual warfare. Uh, the fact that Paul uh, was inspired to write, uh, not just to Timothy, the pastor, but to the Ephesians, the church, is an indicator uh, that revitalization has both, again, a... Uh, doctrinal, uh, theological, but also a practical, a, a lived out component. And both of these things are, are very important. You've got to give careful attention to preserving the purity of what the church believes in order to be able to carry out what the church is to, to do in terms of its mission, in terms of its work. But even just within a few years, uh, we find even here in Scripture, the church at Ephesus is in need of revitalization. And Paul is uh, giving practical exhortations all throughout the book of First Timothy in terms of what should be like. In fact, of course, it's First Timothy where we get the extended treatment about what elders, pastors ought to have in terms of their qualifications, which, of course, I think is uh, significant going back to Paul's address to the elders there in Acts uh, 20. And we see these words of uh, warning about what will happen. And again, uh, 1 Timothy and then of course 2 Timothy, where uh, not too long after this, he writes a second letter in terms of encouraging uh, Timothy as a pastor and the people through Timothy to not be ashamed of the gospel and to be strong in terms of, of grace. We see so much that is happening here. Again, words of reminder, words of exhortation. Paul is warning them about how they should be found and the consequences of what uh, will happen. And of course, 2 Timothy is the last letter Paul would write this side of, of heaven. His last letter, his last words were toward a pastor to encourage that pastor in the ministry of revitalization in the context of a local church here in the New Testament. And interestingly enough, this is not the last time we see the church at Ephesus, is it? We think back to the Revelation. Revelation chapter 1, of course, the, the great uh, vision there uh, John has of the Lord, uh, uh, Jesus Christ, uh, ascended, seated, uh, reigning, ruling. And then in Acts 2, the letters to the churches, which of course is the first church that is written to, is the church at Ephesus. Revelation 2, verse 1, write to the angel, the messenger of the church at Ephesus. Thus says the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks 
among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, and your endurance, and that you cannot tolerate evil people. You have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you have found them to be liars. I know that you have persevered and endured hardships for the sake of my name and have not grown weary. Verse 4, but I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Now, Bible scholars say this comes probably 25 years after Paul's letters to Timothy, around A.D. 90. And by this time, uh, they have abandoned the first love, uh, that which mattered most, the, the first things. Remember verse 5, then how far you have fallen, repent, and do the works you did at first. So we, we've moved from a call for revitalization to an outright call for repentance. And of course, those two things go together. There is no revitalization without repentance in terms of uh, coming to see sin as God sees sin, a, a desire again for purity and holiness in terms of life and doctrine. Do the works you did at first. Otherwise, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. This, this is a word of warning. Uh, the Lord has a serious message for this church they had had the apostle paul back in acts 20 discipling and exhorting the elders decline had set in paul sends timothy writes letters to him and to them and now here we are in a season where the lord says it's either time to repent or I'm pulling the lampstand. Church history tells us that the lampstand did get pulled and the church of Ephesus uh, did uh, dissolve and go away, not to remain. It, it, it's a word and reminder to, uh, to us about the task of revitalization. It is a perennial one. There, there's never a time where you can say, we've, we've been so revitalized that uh, we can now go do something else. We can go focus upon other things. It's a perpetual ministry, a ministry of fidelity and faithfulness to the gospel and to the scriptures and to our Lord is a ministry of revitalization because, again, the tendency is always going to be to, to drift, to become distracted, dissuaded, di diverted from the purpose and the plan. That's why you're there, Pastor. That's why your ministry is so critical, because you're the one who is standing in the gap consistently and constantly calling your people back to what matters most, back to the first things, back to the scriptures, back to the mission. Is it going to be discouraging at times? Yes. Will you see things at times that make you wonder, is it really worth it all? Yes. But ultimately... The reason we do what we do is because of our commitment to the one who is the chief shepherd, the Lord of the church, the one who has called us and commissioned us, who sustains us, even in the midst of the challenges that we have. When people ask me, is church revitalization biblical? My response is absolutely. Not only is it a biblical calling and a biblical a paradigm, I believe, represents the heart of what ought to characterize uh, the pastor of the church for the long haul. Our work should be always that we are committed to doing what we can to help our churches, our people, those entrusted to our care, uh, to be the kind of people who are found faithful, faithful in terms of their life and doctrine and beliefs, faithful in terms of their ministries and their work and their duties, keeping the main thing the main thing, All, always centering ourselves around the Word of God and what matters most. That's what I believe is a biblical paradigm for revitalization. That's what I believe ought to characterize uh, us. Uh, a lot more that that could be said here, but uh, I just want to commend to, uh, to you in terms of uh, your work and your ministry, particularly in this season. Uh, again, my guess is that there are those of, uh, of you who are experiencing uh, questions, uh, navigating these waters of this 
COVID-19 global pandemic. Um, Pastor, the greatest thing I can encourage you to do is to, to stay faithful. Remember your calling. Remember uh, that our Lord, in his infinite wisdom and in his eternal plan, not only sent his uh, only son Jesus to die for your salvation, but called you into the ministry. Of all the people he could have chosen to pastor your church, he chose you. Of all the people he could have chosen to serve where you serve, he chose you. Not because of you, but because he might be glorified in and through you, that he might be able to show himself mighty through the vessel that is you. And so do not be discouraged when you look out and you don't see the things that you wish you saw. Be encouraged that God is working, even in ways you can't always see. And know that what he expects from you is what he's already equipped you to do, to be found faithful in terms of your ministry, your handling of the word of God, your doctrine, and to be an instrument that he uses to help see people come alive afresh and anew, to fall freshly in love with Christ, freshly in love with the people of God, to have a love for those who do not yet know Christ. And then he might use you and your church to make a difference that truly will touch your world and impact eternity. Thanks for letting me share with you this morning. I hope you found this session helpful. Hope we can stay connected again. If, uh, if we're not already connected on social media, I hope you'll uh, find me on Twitter and Instagram at, at Adam Greenway. Our seminary, of course, at Swibbits, S-W-B-T-S on Twitter, at Southwestern Seminary on Instagram. Any way that uh, I personally or our seminary or our Center for Church Revitalization can be a resource and a blessing for you, we want to do that through our conferencing, through our programming, through our resources, and through our degree programs. I hope that Dr. Priest will share more later about our Doctor of Ministry in Church Revitalization, a great degree program for uh, field practitioners, pastors who are uh, serving. Uh, again, thank you for allowing me to have this time uh, with you, and uh, I pray that the rest of your uh, webinar today will be a great blessing and an encouragement to you in your ministry. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Greenway. That is just uh, such a blessing to have you with us. And I will say, uh, you know, in these trying times, uh, the seminary campus has moved to fully online classes. And uh, Dr. Greenway, uh, even today, is doing a virtual preview for students that are interested in attending Southwestern Seminary. He did one last Friday. He has three virtual previews scheduled. So we greatly appreciate him taking time out of his schedule uh, to share with us.